agile and lean thinking, resilience, engineering, and policies and regulations. Uh, um, if I may start with uh, the first uh, presentation, we have uh, uh, Nuruddin Omar. Um, he's going to talk to us about uh, development of integrated uh, framework based on agile principles and functionalities. Good day, everyone. Thank you for attending. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Nuruddin Omar. Today, I would like to present to you my paper about development of integrated framework based on agile principles and BIM functionalities. This paper is about integrating agile principles with BIM functionalities to develop a new approach of management. The framework developed in this paper is to show the mapping and the relationship between Agile principles and BIM functionalities. This framework can be applied during construction, procurement, and design phases in the construction project. Also, this framework to show the behavior of the construction team, management team during the project life cycle. Traditional project management faces many challenges during project life cycle. Over the years, some studies developed an alternative management approaches. Agile project management made a positive impact and a success in software and manufacturing industry. So this paper focused on enhancing agile implementation in construction projects using BIM. The aim of this study is to develop and verify the framework mapping the relation between Agile principles and BIM functionalities. Meanwhile, the objectives is to study these integrations and to develop 2D framework between Agile and BIM integration. During this paper, two methodologies were applied. The first one is questionnaire survey distributed to the professionals in construction and software, software industries to obtain their opinions about Agile BIM integration. Meanwhile, the second one is a framework that is mapping the relationship between 12 of Agile principles and 13 of BIM functionalities. Agile BIM integrated 2D framework is about integrating 12 of Agile principles with 13 BIM functionalities. Each number in this matrix representing one integration, a total of three integrations. Each of Agile principles can be integrated with more than one of BIM functionalities. For example, the visualization BIM functionality can be integrated with priority for working product Agile principles, represented in number one, as highlighted. Also, one of BIM functionalities can be integrated with more than one of Agile principles, like integration number 12 and 13, when the construction process simulation of BIM functionality integrated with Agile principles of satisfying the customer and welcoming changes. Another example is the 4D visualization of construction schedule integrated with three of agile principles of satisfying the customer, welcoming changes, and simplicity, represented in number 15, 16, and 18. All of the 32 integrations will work to support Agile BIM implementation in construction projects lifecycle. The results and findings came back from the professionals' opinions obtained from software and construction industry were positively. They agreed with BIM and, and Agile integration. As an example, the integration between BIM functionality of visualization will support agile principle of priority of working product. 
the, the professionals in both industries, 46% of them agree with that, and 26% of them strongly agree with that. Another question is asked to the professionals in both industries, which including the integration between one BIM functionality and two agile principles represented in a bar chart, which is about BIM functionality of rapid generation of construction plan will support agile principles of welcoming changes and the priority for working product. The results came back positively and the professionals agreed and strongly agreed with these integrations as presented in this chart. Also, another question is asked to the professional in both industries about BIM functionality of 4D visualization of construction schedule will support agile principles of customer satisfaction, welcoming changes, and simplicity. This question included one BIM functionality integrating with the three agile principles as presented in this chart. And the results and the findings came back positively, where the professionals in both industry agree and strongly agree with all these three integrations represented in this chart. Professionals in construction industry and software industry agreed and supported the integration between agile principles and BIM functionalities to enhance the construction project's life cycle. The first conclusion obtained from this research is that 72 of professionals agreed that BIM functionality of visualization will support the agile principle of priority of working product. Another one is that 78 of the professionals agreed that BIM functionality of construction process simulation will support the agile principles of customer satisfaction and welcoming changes. Moreover, 81% of the professionals agreed that BIM functionality of automated cost estimation will support agile principles of simplicity. All the seven results and findings came back from the professionals were highly rating and agreeing with these integrations. This will be all. Thank you for attending. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, you may ask. Yeah, thank you, Nuruddin, uh, for um interesting uh, issues you are raising here uh, integrating uh, uh, beam functionalities and agile uh, principles uh, to enhance uh, uh, construction project management um, and i open the floor for uh, questions uh, please okay i, I will have a uh, a question to start. Um, now, um, this uh, in enhancement uh, of um, the adoption and uh, implementation of uh, Agile uh, using BIM, um, and you have all these um, two-dimensional uh, integration of, of the functionalities and, and the principles. In, in what way do you think this will um, improve the, the the management of of construction projects so when if, if you take some examples of your results yeah actually uh, in construction projects they are uh, keep uh, working on traditional uh, methods and now it's the it's the time to change their minds and to start applying what is the other industries uh, successing of like agile project management it's a huge uh, success in uh, software and manufacturing industry. This type of project management will work on fast track to deliver projects. It is focusing on satisfying a customer. 
Meanwhile, application of building information mod modeling, it's a revolution in construction industry. It's a technological way. So to integrate these both successful methods in construction project, it will deliver a successful item at the end. And it will overcome all many challenges that we are facing, like the coordination between the site team, the office team, the stakeholders. All of these we are facing now in these days with the uh, construction projects. So the application of Agile BIM integration, uh, it will lead us to uh, many positive things like face-to-face -face meetings, short meetings, daily basis, uh, strong coordination with all the teams. So my point of view and from the results I got uh, from my research, uh, it will, it will, I hope it will, and the application, uh, it will success uh, in construction industry and some of the companies start to apply agile project management nowadays. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any, any other comments or um, or questions uh, for uh, Nuruddin? Uh, okay, okay, Joseph, yes, please. Yeah, just a quick one, please, uh, to ask that, how does this impact or, or can this be extended, this framework, can this be used in, in cooperation or, sorry, in conjunction with modern methods of construction, you know, can you, or how can you incorporate this framework into the implementation of the different aspects of modern methods of construction? Actually, during project life cycle, there is, for example, the design stage. During the design stage, the application of uh, building information modeling using the visualization, it can interfere the customer during that stage to see their opinion, to show him the model of the project in real. The management team will coordinate between the customer, between the uh, design team, in order to get the most satisfaction from them. Also, if there is any changes, the implementation of these changes can be easier during the coordination between the customer and the uh, design team. The same will be applied during the construction stage as well. When the project team focus on the coordination between the three parts, the design, the construction team, and the uh, customer, to see if there is any changes will be applied so they can interfere. All these we are facing nowadays in uh, construction industry, and the action will come late. So I think this is, uh, we hope that answer your question. Excellent, thank you very much. Okay, th th thank you, um, Nuruddin, uh, for um, uh, sharing your uh, uh, findings and, and outcomes. Uh, and uh, we move to the uh, next uh, uh, presentation. Uh, we have um, uh, Joseph, um, Joseph, uh, Ofori, uh, in the next uh, presentation, he's going to talk about uh, exploration of the potential for using modular housing solutions to address the UK uh, housing uh, market shortage. Um, and the floor for uh, the presentation of uh, Joseph, please. In this paper, we explore the potential for using modular housing techniques to address the UK's housing sector shortage. This paper is developed in the context of high property prices in the United Kingdom, which are some of the highest risks in all of Europe. The housing stock in the UK is not increasing in land with population trends. So despite the fact that more houses are being built, it doesn't quite match up to the rate of population growth in the UK. High housing costs also affects availability because it affects purchasing power so fewer people are able to buy property. High cost of property and low production rates of residential property combine together to create a housing gap. Now this gap in housing provision is made worse by the skill shortage. In this paper, we explore the potential of using modular techniques and modular approaches in the housing sector to address the twin problems of inadequate provision and the skills shortage. 
This paper seeks to address the gap in existing knowledge. So whilst there is quite a lot of knowledge and information available on the general opportunities and possibilities of off-site and pre-manufactured construction, it is less so with regards to the application in housing. So this paper seeks to address from the viewpoint of professionals in the industry, their views, their perceptions on how modular housing can address the housing sector deficit and how modular housing can also address the skills gap that is especially felt in the housing sector. The overall aim of the paper is to explore if modular housing can indeed be the solution to the housing deficit, as well as the skill shortage that affects the housing sector. To achieve this, the objectives include assessing the current state of housing supply in the UK, identifying the main causes of the UK's housing deficit, investigating the factors which affect the housing stock in the UK, and to explore the potential of using modular housing techniques to address the low housing stock as well as the impacts of skilled labor shortage in the UK. In developing this paper, we have undertaken a wide ranging review of relevant literature. This included literature drawn from books, uh, academic publications, such as journal papers, conference papers. We have looked at industry body reports. We have looked at rev relevant governmental body reports. And we've analyzed these, critically reviewed them to arrive at the conclusions that we make in this paper. Following the literature review, we undertook a questionnaire-based survey of industry professionals in the UK. As a result of the ongoing pandemic and the restrictions associated with it, the survey was limited to an online-only survey using an online-based platform, which was used to disseminate the questionnaires. Altogether, 70 questionnaires were sent out and we had a response rate of 86% being returned for review and analysis. Following the analysis of the literature and the questionnaires, which we got back from the respondents, we found amongst other things that there is a consistently rising housing deficit in the UK despite increased efforts aimed at house building. There is also a lack of relevant skills which affects the industry, especially the housing sector. And together with the high cost of developed houses, it makes the housing deficit worse. We found from the survey that the, the acknowledged, you know, most of the popular benefits, acknowledged benefits that are associated with off-site construction generally can be adapted to modular housing. So we can export these to the modular the housing sector if we're going to build using modular approaches. So benefits such as a lower cost of development, fast construction, higher quality, were acknowledged in the survey to be uh, adaptable to the housing sector. The survey also showed that the potential of modular approaches to become the mainstream approach to development in the housing sector is what, something that the respondents agreed generally. What was interesting though, was that despite the general acknowledgement of these uh, earlier points, the numbers of respondents who were agreeing or affirming to these were relatively low. So though on balance, there was an acceptance that modular housing could be the mainstream approach and the modular housing could bring benefits such as lower cost of construction, quicker construction. The numbers who agreed with these positions were relatively low. Following our analysis of the data arising from the review and from the survey, we are able to make the following conclusions. The firstly, not only is there an undersupply of the housing stock within the UK housing sector, but that the undersupply is getting worse and growing with time. We can also conclude that the housing deficit that is experienced currently in the UK 
is worsened, amongst other things, by the skill shortage that affects the UK construction industry generally, and in particular, the housing sector. The high cost of developments in the housing sector is also a major contributory factor to the housing deficit in the UK. We can also conclude from the study that the application of offsite techniques to the housing sector through the development of modular housing can indeed become the mainstream approach to the development of housing in the UK housing sector. We can also conclude that modular housing can address the skill shortage in the UK real estate sector, as well as addressing the overall housing deficit in the UK. Now, this was what the majority of respondents seem to say. But looking at the, the numbers and the proportions of respondents, we can also conclude that the levels of awareness amongst industry professionals of the potential for modular housing in the UK housing sector are low, and that some increased awareness and education amongst professionals of both the potential and other benefits would be helpful and in our view could increase the uptake of modular techniques generally. So in other words, what we found and what we can say is, it is possible that a lack of awareness amongst professionals could be contributing to the low uptake of modular techniques, especially in the housing sector, and the opportunities for industry professionals to learn more about these could probably increase the uptake of these techniques. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joseph uh, Ofori, uh, for um, addressing uh, a timely issue, uh, actually, in the housing sector in, in UK. Um, any questions or uh, comments uh, for Joseph? Uh, yes, please, Ali. Hi, Joseph. Thank you very much. It's one of my favorite topics, uh, MMC and the Monument of Construction, since I'm doing my PhD in a relevant topic. Um, so, yeah, as you said, there are a lot of issues that can underpin uh, the, the better adoption of MMC. Um, one of the issues is the short uh, shortage of skills, as you kindly mentioned uh, at the end. So do you believe that current skills can be upskilled? Or do we need a new set of skills to deal with the model of construction as a new innovation? Any thoughts on that, please? OK, thank you very much. Uh, I think you're right in your assumption. We, we will need skills in, you know, related or more specifically related to modern methods of construction. So the additional skills or the new skills that we require would not necessarily be the same sort of skills that we find that there is a shortage of. Because at the moment in the UK, as in many other jurisdictions, there is a high shortage of skilled construction labor. The skills uh, that will be required to transform, you know, the processes in the industry to a manufacturing based or factory based one wouldn't be the same. So it will be new uh, skills related more to you know the fact factory production processes uh, in that sense uh, the benefit is that or the trade-off is that we wouldn't necessarily need as many people or in terms of numbers it wouldn't be the same so if we take a project that is developed and implemented using the traditional approach the number of skilled labor requirements or the skilled labor requirements wouldn't be the same if you translated the same thing into the factory setting. Because in factories, you've got automated processes, you've got robots, for example. So the work that one person can do in the factory could be the equivalent of, say, maybe just for argument's sake, 20 people on site. So yes, we will need additional skills, but it is not the same traditional skills that there is a lack of. And then hopefully, if we go that way, we wouldn't need the same numbers to make up for the shortfall. So fewer numbers would be required that can make up for the current shortfalls that we have in skilled labor with the traditional processes. 
Okay, th thank you, Joseph. Uh, uh, I have also a, a comment and maybe it, it, it is a question as well. Um, for uh, modern construction methods and uh, modular housing, there are also challenges and there are a bit of uh, disadvantages. Have you also look at that, uh, uh, looked at that uh, in, in your uh, literature as well as in your uh, empirical study? And what, what are your views on, on, on these uh, issues? Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, you're right. There are many, I wouldn't say just challenges. There are many challenges and there are many hindrances to the uptake and some of them are genuine, you know. For example, one of the biggest issues, you know, according to the Farmer Report of 2016, is that there is no um, quantitative benefit. It hasn't been quantitatively assessed the benefits, you know. Uh, insurance companies and financiers are reluctant sometimes to underwrite products, you know. For example, you want to take a mortgage on a house that has been built using modular approaches sometimes insurers are hesitant. So there are many genuine issues and uh, not as part of this study, but another aspect of my work is looking at how we can address some of those very genuine issues. So for example, I'm in the process, you know, in, together with colleagues working with the PhD student, potential PhD student, to look at the quantitative assessment of the benefits. Whether we can say that if you use modular approaches, maybe it saves you in, in financial terms, 30%, 40%. So those are things that we are looking at. But some of the uh, hindrances are perceptions. So for example, as a throwback, a carry on from the earlier years, you know, uh, when prefabrication was deployed intensively after the wars, you know, to address housing shortages, there was an issue perception. Uh, I wouldn't say a perception, at that stage there was genuine sort of inferior products at that stage. And for many people, that memory, you know, has carried on until now. So some of them are perceptions that need to be addressed. What we found in our study is the lower levels of responses, you know, to some of them just confirm the fact that people probably don't know. So as part of our recommendation that we've made, maybe some additional education or intensified education can help to address those perceptions. But then you're right, there are genuine uh, hindrances and obstacles that the industry needs to investigate, explore and find solutions to. And the benefit is that the opportunities and the benefits that off-sites provide probably far outweigh the difficulty. So it might be worth investing in addressing those genuine concerns and problems and then addressing them for the benefit of the industry so that people can be confident to rely on that as an alternative to the traditional approach. Yeah, th thank you very much uh, for these um, uh, spot on responses uh, to, to, to my uh, points raised. Uh, and uh, most of them in, in my mind, actually, I, I teach modular construction uh, methods and uh, all of these, are, as, as you said, uh, some of them genuine kind of uh, uh, issues and some of them based on, on perceptions, uh, but also when, when they are based on perceptions, uh, there are reasons why these perceptions are developed through the years as well. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph, uh, for, for your uh, sharing of thoughts and, and ideas. Thank you very much. And uh, now we uh, move to our next uh, I, I can I can hear an echo. I'm not sure if you can all hear it, but our next uh, uh, presentation uh, will be by Ahmed Abbas, uh, and uh, it's about uh, efficient utilization of public-private partnerships uh, to develop resilient and uh, sustainable uh, public infrastructure. Hello everyone, this is Ahmed Abbas. I'm pleased to be among you today contributing to this prestigious conference on smart built environment. As a brief introduction, 
I'm a graduate student of the International Business Management Master's Program at Harriet Watt. This is a joint paper with Dr. Yelena, the Head of Economics, Accountancy, Finance, and Executive Education at Harriet Watt Dubai Campus. Today we'll be presenting on the efficient utilization of public-private partnerships to develop resilient and sustainable public infrastructure. Sustainable and resilient infrastructure is the foundation for long-term development, balancing inequality, reducing unemployment, and strengthening sustainable growth. Across most developing and developed countries, infrastructure needs significant improvement, as does its financing ability. It's estimated that the worldwide infrastructure finance gap has reached nearly one trillion US dollars per year as per the World Economic Forum. Under increasing financial constraints, the utilization of public-private partnerships have been growing significantly. It reached up to $90 billion in 2017. Public-private partnerships act as integrating bond between public and private sectors under sets of financial and risk-sharing relationships. If utilized efficiency, efficiently, public-private partnerships can provide better value for money than traditional procurement. However, they can be threatening for the fiscal sustainability for a number of key reasons due to complexity of aspects of risk sharing, affordability, costing, contract negotiation, budget, and accounting treatment. Research gap. The utilization of public-private partnerships has been historically driven by fiscal constraints and financial needs. For example, alternative project finance to restrain public budget optimization of the capital and operational expenditure over the project life cycle without the comprehensive consideration of the wider socioeconomic impact, especially in low and medium income countries where public private partnerships are politically and physically driven. When it comes to the socioeconomic impact of public private partnerships, the, the academic empirical literature is very limited, where most evidence is based on informal and unreliable case studies and evidence. Moreover, most case studies are comparing outcomes before and after the implementation of public partner partnerships without well defined parameters where the overall socioeconomic impact hasn't been comprehensively analyzed using robust analysis. This paper explores the socioeconomic impact of public private partnerships based on output based performance agreements, thus, maximization of the efficiency gain through utilizing the foremost of the private sector expertise and innovation to achieve optimum value for money concurrently with the, uh, delivering predetermined socioeconomic outcomes. Aims and objectives. The identified research gaps within the existing literature of academic research and industrial publications concerning the socioeconomic impacts of public-private partnerships and evaluation of whole life cycle cost raises two significant research questions. The first question, can public-private partnerships drive optimum value for money through incentivized output-based performance across the life cycle of the assets standing out from traditional procurement? And the second question, in the pursuit for a better value for public money, can public-private partnerships deliver tangible socio-economic benefits? This paper tests the following hypothesis about the structure of successful and efficient public-private partnerships, which would be structured as socioeconomic partnerships to derive optimum value for money concurrently with socioeconomic outcomes through incentivized output based performance. The review of the existing literature suggests the importance of understanding and analyzing the overall context of public private partnerships to determine the success factors and the outcomes of output based performance and associated socioeconomic impact. The research approach includes three principal stages and exploratory study to identify the concept, a study research to test the identified concept empirically, review of secondary, secondary sources to confirm the empirical results of the case studies. Findings and results. There is a general agreement within the interview with experts from various sectors of the infrastructure industry on the significance of public-private partnerships in the finance and development of critical infrastructure. One of the main drivers for of public private partnerships is inefficiency of traditionally of traditional procurement through raising debts and awarding separate contracts with fragmented life cycle. It's also broadly agreed that efficiency gains of public private partnerships should uh, have a wider socioeconomic impact. And the main challenge remains to be the balanced distribution of the efficiency gains between the profit driven private sector and the benefit driven public sector. Moreover, while it's being the utmost importance, integrating the stakeholder aspect into the overall PV scheme has shown to be challenging owing to a soft, subjective, and unmeasurable aspect of it. There is a general agreement that incentivized output based performance approach leads to ultimate efficiency gain rather than fixed output level obligations. 
So selective case study demonstrates success stories where the advantage of public partnerships can go beyond the cost and time efficiency during the development of the asset, extending across the whole life cycle of the asset through the long-term implementation and operation process, delivering social economic benefits, contributing to the economic growth and quality of life. For example, reduced service tariff, improved service quality and coverage, service reliability, availability, and moreover, employability and income. Giving some few examples, demand increase, Swabby container, terminal witness increase of 20 foot equivalent units reached 500% over 300,000 TEUs annually compared to pre commission The economic benefit associated with the increase in probability of 172 jobs. Similar examples can be given on the time efficiency in, in roads, creating through public private partnerships, creating reducing the travel time from 100 minutes to 30 minutes and creating 15,000 indirect jobs and 5,000 5, direct jobs uh, in uh, Hyderabad. Reduced service fee for Virgin Small Airlines witnessed the reduction of air fares that resulted in estimated savings of 60 million US dollars uh, and increased the demand of 243,000 between 2005 to 2009, creating jobs and improved salaries. Reduced service fee for Shanghai Water Authority, which caused, uh, which uh, resulted in 40% estimated government reduction service fee, uh, and then retained long-term service fee in Uganda. It witnessed the results of output uh, based performance management contracts for retaining fixed service fee for five years. The analysis also demonstrates the influence of social economic factors on failure of PVPs, failure due to unaffordability, and failure due to political uh, lack of political support. As a conclusion, the incentivized output based performance drives the private sector to achieve optimum efficiency. Simply speaking, public finance cannot suffice for the provision of public infrastructure and services. Additionally, the strict contractual nature of public private partnership has historically succeeded to reduce significantly cost and time overruns. Moreover, socioeconomic parameters as the political support, decision making, and affordability for end users play a key role in the success of public private partnerships. Conclusively, socioeconomic benefits resulting from the output based performance of PVPs can be significant to the socioeconomic growth of quality of life. Thank you, and looking forward to joining the future versions of this conference. Uh, thank you so much, Ahmed, uh, uh, for raising uh, timely issues uh, with the PPP and the adoption of PPP uh, for um, the development of infrastructure. Um, uh, I uh, open the question sessions. Uh, if there are any comments or questions, uh, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Taha, and pleased to be uh, here among yourselves and other researchers and publishers, and uh, hopefully we can join as well and support the future versions of this conference. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Joseph, please come in. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ahmed, for the presentation. I wanted to check your view, your opinion on this. Um, you're right. Public money or government money cannot take care of all the infrastructure needs of society. And PPPs are a welcome alternative in that sense. But in this case, you've got private money, people who are in for the profit. And it hasn't always, you know, in the UK example, for example, not with all PPPs, but with the private finance initiative, uh, it hasn't got, you know, a very good uh, sort of the story around it has not been very good in economic terms. What has been your experience, you know, through your research uh, in terms of the economics? Is it good or bad for the public or society? Sure. Uh, so I think a couple of things here because uh, originally PPPs have been uh, established and they develop and emerged from the UK market since market toucher and it mainly it was it, it emerged because the UK government at that time they lacked finance. Okay, so their budget was very stretched. They couldn't build uh, the number of. Let's give an example. If they need ten schools, they could only build one school. Okay, so. Uh, the value for money analysis is the key in all of this, okay? And the UK under the BF 
I and the BF2, they have been trying to enhance this a lot. But however, the UK is always influenced by political factors and political drivers. Okay, but the, the question is very simple. If you have money, don't do PPPs, but if you don't have the money and you need to develop infrastructure, this is the only way to do it. And your only risk mitigation measure is try to drive more value for money, uh, is to try to drive more socioeconomic impact rather than just a financial uh, tool to develop the different infrastructure. Okay. However, my personal opinion that in developed infrastructure and developed countries, if they have the finance, they shouldn't do PPPs. However, this model is still working very well in Australia and Canada and the US. It's just, I think it's just a, a period and an era in the UK where the political direction is against PPP because of all of the, the gap in the funds and all of that, I would say. So what they have done in the UK, if you have seen, there is the National uh, Audit Office, NAO, and they have produced a document which is very useful, which I can share as well. And it showed that if they use private money, uh, sorry, public money to develop these projects, okay, it would have saved them billions and billions, which is very true, but you don't have the public money to use. So there is the opportunity if you if you know the concept of the the cost of the opportunity. So this is where it's everything is lost. So I hope my answer was uh, clear. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, I've I've got uh, uh, an, another question, and uh, I'm, I'm aware of uh, time as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, PPP uh, PFI. Uh, started in 1992 and then uh, developed uh, through the conservative and, and labor governments uh, after the 1997 uh, uh, took over. Uh, but uh, after the credit crunch in 2008, uh, uh, PPP PFI faced a lot of challenges and the shortage of uh, uh, private finance uh, in, in the global markets. Um, and so then the PF2 version came in, uh, but it looks that uh, it, it, it didn't uh, pick up um, from where the uh, peak of the PPP in uh, 2007. So what, what, what's your view? Uh, the, there, there are challenges facing the private finance for uh, public infrastructure and it's, it's, it's going on that kind of challenge. Uh, what, what, what's your view on that? Sure, so I'll try to keep my answer brief uh, because I'm aware of time, but that's a very good point that you're raising, Dr. Taha. So the issue is that after the financial crisis, the price of uh, private finance has increased. Okay, so the PPP even became more invisible. They are moving, the feasibility has been moving away from the balance that they are looking for. When now, as you know, it's, I think it's more strict government is more of a labor government uh, in the UK, more of a republic government. And the government now in the UK are in the direction of that, that when they do, when they compare private money developments financed by public finance compared to developments financed by private finance, they find it cheaper. And that's normal because you are paying the cost of private finance. If you have the money, you should build it yourself. If you don't, that's, that's uh, you, there is no other way. So I, I think personally that the, the method where they're evaluating the, the, the PPPs isn't the right method because you cannot just keep a school or a hospital in the queue until you get more money. You'll have to build it. And what the only thing that you can do is to make this money more efficient. In other countries like Saudi Arabia, for example, where they have the money, now they're moving towards PPP for a different set of reasons. Of course, finance is one reason to build, like, let's say, 10 schools instead of one school in the same year. But at the same time as well, they discover that in these countries, they lack the experience and they need to use the private sector for their experience. So the inefficiency that they discovered from those projects is significant. So we just need to move beyond the, the cost of financing and look for the other benefits. That's why socioeconomic impact is very important. Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, Ahmed, uh, for all these uh, points. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, for your uh, other outcomes and outputs from your research. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we move to the uh, next uh, presentation. Uh, and it's uh, by uh, Angelica uh, and uh, Elaine uh, and uh, uh, Andrea. Uh, that's on the strategies of urban resilience 
uh, related to the built environment and overview of the literature. Hi, I'm Angelica Prado, and I'm going to present the article Strategies of Urban Resilience Related to the Built Environment, an overview of the literature. According to United Nations, cities are population concentration hubs with a forecast that will shelter 70% of the world's population by 2050. But most cities already present serious problems in these contexts such as lack of sanitation, population, and households located in inappropriated places. Additionally, the construction industry consumes a considerable part of the raw material extracted from nature, being responsible for one-third of greenhouse gas emissions of the world. In this sense, it is important to understand the role of the built environment in the well-being of cities. Urban resilience is placed by literature as a new urban development and governance agenda involving actors from all sectors generating globally applied standards and evaluation tools that make urban resilience technical and managerial. However, there is a gap to be filled when it comes to studies on urban resilience in the context of the construction industry. Therefore, the aim of this paper is to present an overview of the current literature on the implementation of urban resilience strategies directly related to the built environment and the construction industry. It seeks to identify how such studies recognize and threat urban resilience based on the classification and analysis of the strategic actions they advocate. The present study performs a systematic mapping of the literature supported by bibliometric indicators. The research was divided into two phases. In the first phase, uh, called the limitation of publications, a choice of research terms, string formulation, choice of databases, and article selections was made. The choice of search terms was made based on the adaptation of the PICO method, a method that determined string research by expressions that represents uh, population intervention, comparison, and outcomes. The result was combined with Boolean operators generating the strings shown in the first frame. The Science Direct Web of Science, Emerald, and Scopus database were used to carry out the research. And the articles selected were from journals indexed in the time interval of the last five years. As a result, we identified a total of 658 articles. Due to the large amount of articles, three filters were used, classification by title, by abstract, and by relevance after full reading. After screaming, 17 were remained. In the second phase, the 17 validated articles were classified by region, year of publication, number of stations, strategic actions, stated, and nature of research. The graph shows the classification of the selected papers by region, year, and number of citations. Asia stands out with 63 citations, followed by North America with 22. It is observed that 2018 and 2020 are the years that had the most publications, and the South American region in turn presents only two articles. The articles were also evaluated according to the research methodology adopted. Considering the classification by nature of research, these studies were clustered into three categories, framework, case studies, and literature reveals. Most of the selected articles, 59%, were classified as case studies that have a local approach, and the studies that showed the lowest number of citations were classified as case studies. However, when analyzing the year of publication of articles, this trend is justified, since most of the studies listed as a case study are more recent publications. From the detailed reading of the articles, it was also possible to identify and classify strategic actions that involve the construction industry and have the potential to improve urban resilience. A total of 47 actions were identified. The actions were also classified into three categories, model development, certification, and new approach slash technologies. It was possible to observe that the studies classified as case studies do not present a relevant number of actions, even though this category represents the major amount of publications analyzed. It is also observed that most of the actions identified are classified as actions related to new approach slash technologies. As conclusions, the simple obtained through the aforementioned method reveals that there is still much to be done in the context of the construction industry addressing strategies that make your, your urban environments more resilient. 
Um, the construction industry plays an important role in the adapting to climate risk since consumes large amounts of insulin generates a lot of waste and moreover the products generated by it continue to consume natural goods. And it was also noticed a pattern of innovation and governance tools showing that the innovation movement, the sector is evolving and it is necessary that these changes receive support from government policies and are accompanied by professional training programs from the sector. The need to investigate urban resilience in different regions and the regions of Asia, South America, Euroasia, and Africa have shown an approach that takes more account of the social aspect. And North America, Europe, and Oceania are more focused on government policies and technological infrastructure advances. Thanks for listening. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Angelica, for uh, raising this uh, uh, comparative uh, analysis uh, on, uh, on the papers uh, which you reviewed. And uh, I open the floor for uh, uh, any questions, please. Uh, okay, I have I have two questions. Uh, the, the first one about your methodology. Uh, have you used any uh, qualitative uh, technique or tool uh, like uh, in vivo uh, in, in, on, on your uh, uh, analysis or uh, you've done this, uh, um, I mean, uh, manually by uh, uh, constructing uh, matrices for comparisons of, of the of the literature uh, papers uh, and and the second point actually the last uh, of your conclusion where which uh, uh, got my eyes uh, that uh, the, the difference between uh, uh, Europe uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, North America and uh, South America and, and the rest uh, in, in the uh, the focus uh, of of their uh, policies, if you can also elaborate on that, uh, there is quite an uh, interesting point there, actually. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, thank you for the questions. I'm. I, I want to clarify that I'm Elaine. Uh, I'm not Angelica that present the 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 paper. Uh, Angelica is my my student. I am her supervisor. Uh, unfortunately, she don't have the opportunity to be here at the congress. But well, I, I'm here happy to to answer all the questions. Okay, the first one was about the methodology. Uh, we didn't use in vivo. Uh, what Angelica did in this part of his work, her work, uh, this only uh, th this paper is only a part of her work uh, at all. Uh, and this is the first stage. She did a systematic uh, literature review in this part, and she didn't use any vivo. But she did uh, all this methodology to find these uh, 17 articles. And after that, she read with um, with a systematic um, way to find in all content um, the strategies of resilience. After that, she well, she uh, um, separates all then uh, identifying the clusters. She only uh, and defined the clusters after she used in an Excel plan. In a, yeah, in a, in a Excel um, uh, document, she she separate all the um, all the strategies and identify that, that clusters. Uh, I want to clarify that uh, as a first part of the stage, she did that. She did these clusters, and after that, she, what she did uh, was. Um, Compare the uh, do a compare analysis of these clusters of these strategies with the documents we have in our city, in Salvador. 
the whole work of Angelica was uh, to identify um, post, um, um, actions, identify um, difficult of our city, that is Salvador of Bahia in Brazil, uh, to, to well to uh, uh, suggest good practices to improve resi resilience for the constru in construction industry here in our city. Okay, because of that, uh, now uh, as uh, answer uh, your your se answer your second question. Um, this is, was a, this first stage was a very important uh, stage for uh, for our work because she identified the importance to really work on regional scale when we are working about urban resilience. We have a lot of uh, uh, specific aspects that uh, particular aspects that we have to 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 study in each region uh, when we are talking about these issues. Then. Uh, because of that, she did um, uh, analysis, uh, a compare analysis uh, with the global situation and the local situation, analyzing an, analyzing documents of Brazil, of Bahia, uh, of Salvador, uh, that work with um, uh, strategic resilience uh, uh, issues. And after that, the first stage was uh, the... Um, was the the interviews that uh, she did with uh, professionals of our city. She already did that. We are doing another paper to the civil world, uh, presenting all these results. And well, with uh, because of that, uh, she she well um, after this this stage, she did she she answered that question. What uh, question she has? Uh, 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 what issues she has to to take um, attention in our region scale, uh, considering all these clusters we identify at the uh, literature review. This stage now we are present here in this congress. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for covering uh, the, the, the two issues. Um, now I, uh, I'm, I'm aware of uh, the time, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, I know that uh, uh, Theo and Mariam, uh, they, 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 they have another paper in uh, a, a previous uh, track and uh, uh, Mariam uh, apologized for not attending uh, because uh, uh, she has got uh, uh, health problems. Uh, we wish her well soon. Um, uh, do we have the uh, presentation, or uh, or um, because the, the the first presentation we we didn't manage to get, but maybe she sent this one. Yeah, yeah, Doctor Taha, she sent this one seventy two. So uh, uh, shall we uh, just uh, 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 present it because uh, we are three minutes over time, I think. Um, yeah, as you like. Do you want oh, me to present it? Oh, oh, okay, we we present it and then and then we move to the next session. Okay, okay. thank you. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. The title of this presentation is uh, The Challenges to the Adoption of Strategies and Regulations for Energy Efficiency Initiatives in the Retrofitting of Retail Centers. And the study was conduct conducted by Theo C. Hopt, Miriam Akinolo, and Fasna Narain from the Mango City University of Technology, Durban, South Africa. Um, this study examined the awareness um, and implementation of energy efficiency retrofit initiatives in retail centers, as well as the challenges um, experienced in the implementation of these retrofit initiatives in retail centers. Um, South Africa has uh, South Africa is one of the largest coal producers in the world, and as an energy efficient as as an energy intensive country, is dependent on coal. Um, generated energy. To meet the 
uh, energy crisis, the South African government published the SANS 10400XA to oblige all new and majorly retrofitted buildings to comply with energy efficiency requirements set out in code. Um, between 2013 and 2019, 50% of firms worked on green building projects and more than half of the projects were retrofit projects. So um, basically energy retrofit is the preservation and refurbishment of buildings and their continued operation using energy efficient technologies and practices. It has been observed that low to medium cost energy retrofit interventions bring sustained energy um, savings. So um, this study used the South African green building legislation to form the basis of the study. The energy efficiency strategy of South Africa 2005 um, was used in this study and uh, these strategies are the SANS 5001 to ratio 2011, the SANS 204 and the SANS 10400 XA. So um, energy efficient, so the reset methodology, this slide speaks about the reset methodology. So um, the energy efficiency strategy in South Africa classifies buildings into sectors where energy consumption can be reduced. So this um, figure shows the classification of um, the buildings in sectors. So the buildings um, were classified into commercial buildings, residential buildings, industrial buildings, and transportation. And under commercial buildings, we have the new buildings and the old or existing buildings. And then um, under the existing buildings, we have um, those buildings that are energy efficient or those that required energy um, retrofit. So um, the SANS 2004 divides a building into three parts and a further six sections, which can be retrofitted to make the energy efficient. So the first part are the general requirements. And these, uh, the sections under the general requirements are the site orientation, building orientation, and design. And then we had the we had the natural ventilation. And under the natural ventilation, we have the building CA, building services, which is um, can also be called lighting and water. And then under the third part, we have the HVAC services, which um, can be categorized into mechanical ventilation and air conditioning. Yeah, th thank you for uh, Mariam and Theo and uh, uh, we can uh, contact them through emails uh, if we want to raise any questions or comments uh, as well. Uh, and we will find that in the conference uh, proceedings and the abstract book as well. Uh, I would like to thank all the presenters and the, uh, the audience uh, in, in, in this uh, track uh, and, with, and the contribution and sharing of their uh, knowledge and experiences. Uh, and uh, we can join. Uh, I think we are we, we, we are about maybe um, nine minutes or so uh, more. Uh, we can join the uh, opening session room uh, for uh, the the, the uh, last concluding and discussion uh, uh, session uh, for of the of the conference. So uh, I, I will see you there. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you.